Welcome back, everybody. This is the Triple B Podcast, a.k.a. Barbell Benders Podcast. Thank you for tuning in. If you're new here, this is a podcast with two college lifters, myself, Seth Todd, and... Altman Biggs. We are... uh, we're fans of strength training. We're we're in our lifting career right now, in the early stages of it. Altman's trying out some strongman stuff, um, and I'm just a straight up equipped power lifter. And we like to bring you the best knowledge and information that we can, so you can use in your training and uh, get better. So, Altman, what are we talking about today? We're we'll talking about coaching and what you should be looking for in coaches um, online versus in person, and just what makes a good coach. There we go. Sounds good. So, the first thing. What, what What's the first thing we want to look for in a good coach? So, the first thing that um, I want to look for in a good coach, which is arguably the most important thing in life as well, is uh, how they communicate and, and their ability to communicate things. Um, now, this is a little bit different between um, online and in-person coaching, and it's a little it's a little bit easier in person, I'd say. Um, but I, I want them to be able to, um, you know, if, if there's something I don't understand or I'm not getting a cue, uh, I want them to basically like dumb it down for me. You know, mm-hmm. that's, that's their job is to be able to help me figure out what I need to do to improve my training. Um, and if I'm not picking up a cue or someone I'm helping is not picking up a cue, I need to change the way I'm saying it so maybe they can understand it a different way. Um, and then, you know, changes to the program um and and that communication it works both ways from coach to athlete and athlete to coach um the athlete should should uh, be able to talk to the coach about how they feel about what's in the program um you know what they think is not working what needs to change what they need to add um and then you know it's it's a it's a, a split between coach and athlete um they should they should be able to work together to find the best program available to help the athlete progress. So what do you, um, what do you think about like the online coaching communication part, Altman? Uh, I agree with you. It's, it is definitely a lot easier in person. Um, I do see it, it's a lot easier to get results in person, a lot easier, um, mainly because if you sometimes you ask the client to send a video or give them their feedback, and sometimes they don't do it. And that just makes your job that much harder instead of just being right then and there saying, all right, being able to make that adjustment right then or making that technique change right there. Um, so so it, it has to come both ways. The coach can go halfway, but he can't make them video it all the time or do something that, that – because sometimes people forget. Um, and as a, as a coach, being an online coach, coaching, you might have many other clients, and it's kind of hard to kind of micromanage every single day. Um, so it, it definitely comes down to – uh, having, but they both have to be uh, equally involved in the programming for sure. Both have to be. Um, they both have to meet halfway because the coach can give you the plan and everything, but if you're not doing the things that the coach needs for you to do to show you like this, your technique or give you the feedback, then you're not going to get the best results that you possibly can. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I know. Like um, when we were in school, I had Dylan right there every workout to to help coach me in person. Um, and then we're on break now, so I've just had to, you know, I send videos to him you know, after my main lifts. And you know, there are times, there are times that I have honestly just forgotten to video. Mm-hmm. Um, it happens. But how do you feel when when you tell someone to video and like like one of your clients and uh, you know, they repeatedly just don't send you anything because that makes your job exponentially harder, right? Yeah. Um, usually, uh, for the, like the for like three weeks straight, I'm like, hey, send me a video, send me a video. And if they don't do it, then I just stop saying it. Um, apparently, it's not that important to them. And they, hey, that, that's fine. It's not as important to everybody. So I'll just keep writing the program for you um, and doing what I'm and get basically guesswork and ask and seeing how you respond to our messages or calls. And it's really just. You do the best you can with what you got. Um, you can't make them. You can't. You can take a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. That's basically <laughs> it. Um, you That's can't it. make them. You can't make them do everything. Yeah, that uh, that video, especially for for strictly online coaches, and I mean, video is important whether you're in person or online, either way. But especially online, videoing your sets and reps is so important because you can 
you can verbally communicate as much as you want to your coach about how that workout or set went, but that video is going to tell you a hundred different things, you know, their, their bracing, their stance, their grip, um, how, how fatigued they seem in the workout, you know, uh, so many different, different things. And that's why, you know, if, if you are a, a coach with an athlete online, that like Alvin said, that video is super important because it not only helps you, but it helps the coach as well to, to help better you. And then, you know, even if you're in person, you know, take some videos of your, your top sets. So you can not only look at them right after the set to, to correct things, but look at them down the road and see how much you've improved upon. Yes, for sure. Um, and one thing I want to bring up about communication, um, I've been coached by people before and I'm someone that loves to learn, have a plan. Well, someone that loves to know the plan. I tell all my clients what the plan is. Um, I don't like to have anybody that's not in the know. If you're going to be a client of mine, you're going to be in the know. Um, it's imp- I think it's important for the, but the coach and the client to both be on the same page with the plan because that's going to make what's going to make the plan go a lot smoother. Um, when I when I was being coached by people, I didn't and they didn't tell me the plan. I was like, oh, um, okay, I'll, I'll do it. Um, but then I would send them a message like, hey. Uh, what are we doing this week? What's the plan? And then, then it would seem like they got real, uh, kind of defensive about it. And usually when someone sends me a message like, hey, um, why are we doing this? I'm like very upfront about it. I'm like um, telling them, oh, yeah, so this is going to be for this. And that's clearly he's saying to me, I didn't explain it well enough. So that's why they're asking the questions. So that just telling me, hey, I need to explain this better. And I need to let them know why we're doing it, when we're going to do it, and what we're doing it for. Just so we everybody's on the same page. Because I think that... It, when you're designing a program for somebody, motivation to train is going to be one of the things that makes keeps them progressing, their motivation. Um, you've probably seen it with your training. I've seen it with my training. The more excited you are about training, the better you're going to progress. And if they're excited about the plan and they know what the plan is and they know that, okay, this is going to be a little bit lower volume, this is going to be a little bit lower volume, this is going to be a little bit higher volume, this is going to be a little bit lower intensity, or this is going to be a little bit lower intensity, higher volume, so I can get some size or some base work done. So I can do the strength work later. It's just, I, I just find that it helps the client a lot better when they know what the plan is instead of just giving them, say, okay, this is the plan, and not saying anything else. What's your experience? Because I know you've been working with Dylan. How do you all do that? Yeah, so like um, we came off the deload, or I came off the deload this week, and we uh, he sent me the progression of, of what we want to do throughout up until nationals, and I liked what I saw. And we hop on a call today to talk about um, the things that we're going to change or do the same with, um, you know, throughout these next four weeks of raw training. Mm-hmm. And, you know, like we took, like Sunday's my squat day, we took high bar, replaced it with low bar. And, um, you know, he explained to me, you know, we're getting a little bit closer. You've been doing five weeks of high bar to kind of fix that chest position. Now we're switching to low bar because it's more specific, more specific to your comp movement. Um, you know, it's time to, to start getting a little closer specificity. Um, and then I, I was asking him questions like, you know, are we going to keep close grip Larson, which is what I do on my main bench day? Mm-hmm. And he's like, no, because we need to start working more comp bench. You know, that close grip Larson is good for building raw bench power, but we're doing this. We're changing it because. Yeah. Um, and then I asked him, you know, are we going to keep Paul's deadlifts? And he's like, uh, I think he said, no, we're going to go back to regular deadlifts. Um, you know, and you know, I was, I was happy about that because mm. Paul's deadlifts suck. They're not the most fun. <laughs> yeah. But um, it's and I and I think as a coach, I haven't coached anybody. Um, and you can probably attest to this that you're. It makes you happy and excited when when somebody asks a question oh, because that means they're inquisitive. They're not just taking what you give them and going and doing it. Yeah. Um, you know, they're actually thinking about what you give them. And, and, you know, trying, trying to learn something and figure out why you're doing this, why you're doing that. Um, so I'm sure you like when people ask you questions. For sure. Dude. And I love to, I love like you, the, when you, you first came to me about the podcast, you're like, oh, I mean, you seem like you're somebody that likes to talk. So yeah, I love to talk about, I love to talk about like coaches love to talk about their program because we write the program. We know why we're doing the, we know why we're going to give you the program. We know everything about the program. A good coach is going to know everything. They is going to have a reason for why they put everything into their program. It's not going to just going to be oh, we're going to do this because of this. This is, pretty, is probably a pretty good reason they're putting it in there. And if they don't have a good reason, they're just saying like, uh, I just want to do this because I just want to do this. Um, they're probably not as good of a coach as you think. Um, 
I've been helping the high school football team, my old high school football team, with their programming and everything. And that's kind of what they did. They would just put exercises on a board. And I was like, okay, let's let's figure this out. Let's do – okay, for every single exercise or kind of movement you do, we need to have a why for that. So it's if you want to do a power clean deadlift, that's fine. But why are we doing it this way and why are we doing it in this order? So just always have a why. That's one thing I learned with the strength coaches at Mississippi State. Always have a why for what you're going to put in your programming. And another thing I want to bring up, a coach, as a coach, you need to be adaptable to your athletes. Um, there are a lot of coaches that like, no, the people have to adapt to me. I think a coach, as a coach, you have to learn people's different personalities. That's the reason you're a coach. Is because as a coach, you have to be able to say, okay, this person responds better to this, this person responds better to this. Or this person, I have to talk to them this way, and this other person, I have to talk to them a different way. It's just like being a leader. You can't talk to everybody the same way. You have to be able to uh, kind of divvy it up. Um, and as a coach, not every, you can't not everybody's going to have the same program. And not everybody should have the same program because everybody's going to be different. I'm sure when Dylan, when he coaches you, he's going to coach Morgan a different way. He's going to give Morgan a different program. He's going to give Zach a different program. Because you guys like different things. I mean, you're an equip lifter. They're raw lifters. So they have something completely different. It's not just all about, all right, you're, I'm, a, I'm the coach. You can either get, get on my way or you can hit the highway. It, you coach, it, you have to be adaptable. <laughs> yeah, you're exactly right about that. Like, between, between me and Zach, there's some things that we do the same because we have similar problems that we need to work on. Mm-hmm. And there's some things that we do different. Um, like I noticed from looking at Zach's Instagram and the stuff he posts, um, so like Dylan's been having me do pause deadlifts for a while and I did them before the November meet and I noticed Zach was doing one and a half deadlifts. Um, so he comes up halfway, goes back down and then does a full rep. And I don't know the exact reasoning behind that. I don't really need to know, you know, I'm sure, I'm sure Zach understands why he needs to do it. And I'm understanding why I need to do straight up pause deadlifts Mm -hmm. because my bottom position is the weakest. So, you know, there can be similarities between different athletes, but there also should be differences kind of tailored to their needs and problems they need to fix. Yes. And this kind of this kind of brings up like in high school football. I've I've talked about my coach all the time, you know, pretty much every episode. He was terrible. There's he didn't know how to write a program. He would give us like we'd work up to, you know, a top set on whatever our main lift was, and then he would write down pretty much whatever he could think of, like six supersets. Not just like six sets, like six different exercises, like four by ten on everything. Yeah, yeah, like like four by ten, four by twelve, whatever it was. And he would do it like, oh, it's leg day. I'm just going to throw in every kind of leg thing there is. (laughs) You know, squat jump, step up, split squat, you know, whatever it was. And I feel like he didn't really have a rhyme or reason to it. And... You know, as as a football team, now that I, I've i learned a lot more in the last two years about, like, programming and such, and the more I realized that he didn't know what the heck he was doing <laughs> because, you know, he would – I feel like there should be a slightly different workout between, like, linemen and skill guys. Yeah. Because obviously, you know, they do different things on the field. Mm-hmm. So, and – he, he had no idea how to manage fatigue. You know, we would go in and do just a ridiculous amount of stuff. And this kind of brings me to my next point. Um, a coach should be able to read nonverbal cues. Yes. Um, as, as well as having that verbal communication, they should be able to look at an athlete and tell maybe how they should structure that day. Now, I understand football is a lot different from powerlifting. You know, you got to go and you got to get the work done. You know, there's there's games to win, but they just come in and they look like they hate themselves. They don't want to be there. That's a problem. Yeah. You know, you need to look at your workouts and figure something else out um, versus like if you're a coach of a single athlete and they come in uh, to a workout and they're just they're not really talking much. They're looking kind of sluggish. They they just have a very. Like, you know, sad demeanor. They just, you know, look dead. Whatever it is, you need to be able to look at that. And if you need to, you know, communicate with them and ask them what's going on. Yeah. And Because maybe, you know, if, if they're in like a slump in life um, or stress is really high from school, work, family, whatever it is, that's going to have an effect on their training. For sure. And 
you need to be able to see that, communicate with them, and adjust accordingly. Because, you know, you go in and, like, Dylan has me rate my motivation to train. And if I came in a week previous that it was at like a three, you know, he would say something. He'd be like, hey, man, what's going on? Why, is, why do you not want to be here? Um, and then he would probably, you know, drop some sets accordingly. Yeah. Dude, I'm impressed. I really am. Not a lot of people talk about that. Um, that's something that uh, one of the, my favorite strength coaches to listen to, he's the strength coach for the Arizona Cardinals. He is big into that. He's like, how do the guys respond in the weight room? How do they respond right when you talk to them? Um, and I've kind of used the same thing for my clients. If uh, I've got some clients that love to talk. And when they come in and they're talking and talking, I'm talking, I'm like, oh, it's go time. We are going. We're, we're, take, we're taking off. And if they come in and they're just like, ugh, they, they don't say anything. And they're like, yeah, yeah. And you can kind of tell at the end of the workout, too, because they, they, at the beginning of the workout, they're talking, talking, talking. And towards the end of the mm-hmm. workout, they, they kind of <laughs> a little bit more quiet, a little bit more quiet. I'm like, okay, now we're getting a little bit of fatigue in there. But if uh, I think that's a, what you mentioned, man, is great. That's awesome. Um, I 100% agree how your people respond um, in the weight room and just how you, they respond when you talk to them. And like you said, uh, if there are guys that are coming in there and then they are feeling just really tired and they just look awful – and they don't really have a lot of energy, and they're not talking or anything, you know that they're probably pretty fatigued, and there's something going on. Um, if they're coming in and they're feeling good, they're like, oh, they're energetic, they're goofing around and everything, you're like, okay, it's go time. Let's let's <laughs> turn it up. Let's go. either go with the plan or let's turn it up a little bit. It just depends on that. Um, that's just having, being a, a good coach. You have to know when to push it, when to back off. Yeah, like you said, being adaptable. And like, of course, of course, there's times to to put your head down and grind. Mm-hmm. Um, you can't you can't tone down every workout just because someone's not you know feeling a hundred percent. But you got you got to be able to tell when is the time to pull it back a little bit. Yeah, and and that's that's kind of what I like about the way that you know Dylan programs for me. You know, I have a top set that I work up to at a certain RPE, and then I have a range of like two to four, two to five back down sets up to a certain RPE. Mm-hmm. So if I'm super fatigued that day, like we'll, we'll take last week for an example. I worked, uh, I night guarded for a firework tent and I was working night shifts, 10 PM to 8 AM. And on the days that I trained, you know, I, I work night, I did that four days in a row and I would, um, I'd sleep a little bit during the day and I'd go in and still work out. I wasn't going to take workouts off cause I was tired. Mm-hmm. That's not me. But you know, and I and I put down on my sheet that um, fatigue was a little bit higher and motivation to train was a little bit lower, you know, because I was tired from working those night shifts. Um, but like on those kind of days, and I'm lucky it was a deload week, so it wasn't hugely important. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I could if I was only able to do two sets instead of four, you know, that's just how it is that day. And you yeah. just got to take what you can and work with it. Um. One of the biggest things, like, uh, I'm working with the high school football team, and I'm working with a D1 guy now. He he plays at Jackson State. Um, his, he's been taught, like, by his father, by everybody, that you have to go 100% all the time. Every single time. You, 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 no breaks. No breaks whatsoever. If you're feeling if you're feeling tired or there's something that's bothering you, you push through the pain and everything. And I've been telling him, like, yeah, that's how you get hurt. And you know what happened? He messed, he up, his ha- he messed up his hamstring. I was like, there we go. That's that's what happens. Um, when you don't take breaks, you keep on pushing and pushing and pushing. You don't give yourself time to kind of back off and recover. You're going to get injured. You're just gonna, it's going to happen. You have to go two steps forward once, or three steps forward, one step back. That's just how strength works. That's how strength conditioning works. If you go in lin- linearly all the time, you're eventually going to run. You're going to run yourself into the ground because you cannot progress linearly all the time. And I was telling these high school guys, these high school kids, this, and they're like, "What? Huh?" Like, this kid was like, dude, I got something going on with my quad. Like, it's really bothering me. And this kid, you can tell he's not really a big complainer. He, Whatever uh, you give him to do, he does it. No complaint. He just does it. He does it 100% capacity. He's like, dude, my, my quad's bothering me. I'm like, stop. You're done. He's like, what? I was like, yeah, stop. You're done. No reason. Which is the first day of us doing this. There's no reason for you to hurt yourself. He's like, whoa, I've never heard that. I was like, yeah, because nobody knows how to do that now. Nobody knows how to kind of dial you back or push you 
Now, when it's go time and when it's time to push him, you know it's time to push him. But when, sometimes you just got to be able to dial it back and be like, all right, come back to fight another day. Yeah, I think that's that that typical high school football mentality yep. is that 100% all the time, go, 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 whatever you're feeling, forget about it, block it out, and keep going. Yeah. And that's what my, my football coach was. Like, you know, he could he could look at our nonverbal cues, see that we're struggling, you know, someone is in pain, we, got, we tweak something, and, you know, you would say something to him, and he would either tell you to keep going or he would get an attitude and tell you to get out of there. Yep. You know, and, and while you were in the recovery process, he would always be pushing you to come back sooner than you needed to. Yeah. Um, and that's that's another thing. Like, and that's and I'm and I'm glad you you were able to tell that kid this because most of the time there's only two ways that you can learn to not go 100 percent all the time. And it's the first way is if someone tells you that or you get hurt and figure it out on your own. Yeah. You know. There's a time and place for it, and but there are kids, there are kids that you have to learn. Like you have to learn to push. Of course, there are gonna be people that are just aren't as driven as others. But those that are driven, someone probably like yourself, you might have to get them to pull, pull back sometimes because they might go too much sometimes, so they don't spill over and then start injuring themselves. Like this this D1 guy, he's one of those guys that he really loves to push himself. He really loves to just train and everything, which is great. So you have to find, okay, so what can we do that he can train almost every day but have it different days of where, like, okay, he can just feel like he did this, but he really didn't do that much. Mm-hmm. So you have to kind of figure out, uh, like, uh, this goes back to the programming. Some Somebody might have a program that's, like, six days a week. Somebody might have one that's three days a week, just depending on how they deal with stress and then how much they love to train. Yeah, and that's, that's like, the thing. Like, you have to, you have to be able to – see how they're responding to the program, you know, talk to them, ask them how they're responding. And then, like we said, look at those nonverbal cues, Mm -hmm. you know, how they carry themselves, if they're limping a little bit, um, and put that all together, all together, and see as a coach if you need to dial it down a little bit for that athlete or you need to tone it up, you know. If if they're just always busting through everything you give them and, you know, they, they need a little bit more. So we got communication. So our next point. Take it. Go ahead. Yeah. So our next point, um, I think you should what you should really look for in a coach is experience and knowledge. Um, so a coach you get, they they should definitely have more knowledge than you. Um, not only in whatever facet they're training you for, but also in like uh, like the programming standpoint from it. So they should. They should be very experienced with writing programs. Um, and, you know, you, you may find a coach that you're their first athlete they're programming for, but they've done programming for themselves or a couple of others in the past. So they, they kind of know how beginners will respond to certain things in a program. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, you know, they also have experience in, in whatever, whatever they're training you for. So, you know, if you're, if you're doing powerlifting training – I wouldn't. I wouldn't hire a bodybuilder to yeah. write my programs. That didn't make any sense. Someone who's never competed, um, and like like Dave Tate talks about this a lot. Um, you know what to look for in a good coach, and he he put a little thing on Instagram, and how like how to rank your coach, and I think it was pretty pretty harsh. It was like a one yeah. to five scale. It was, and unless, unless they had like over ten years of experience, they didn't get a five, um, and I think that's kind of ridiculous. Because, like, in, in my situation, Dylan's been training me. He's got um, he's got more years of me than competing. And he has worked with the, the powerlifting team for multiple years. So he does have experience in competing. Um, he has experience in equipment. So, you know, he's been in equipment for, you know, I don't know how many years. It's not a lot. It's not 10 or 15. But it's a lot more than I have. Yeah. And so... You know, I'm going to listen to what he says. I'm going to, um, you know, ask questions because he, the, you know, he, he's, he's taught me a lot of things that he had to learn on his own that he's given me kind of the backdoor secret for, um, they can figure it out. So I don't have to learn the hard way about, um, you know, like some of the, some of the things, exercise that he gives me, he's probably done himself to, to fix problems that he is correct. I like what you just said there. 
every single coach, no matter what exercise you program for, you better have done that exercise. <laughs> I don't care like who you are or what kind of coach you are. If you're putting an exercise in there, you better have done that exercise, no matter what you do in the program. If And same thing with like programming principles. If you haven't done that style of programming, I'm not going to tell you to do it because I don't know how it's going to go. Um, but yeah, like you said, um, it's experience, but of course, us being young, we don't have a ton of experience, and but we have to start somewhere. Um, I'd rather start now instead of starting ten years later. Ten years later, because that's ten. That's ten years of just practice, practicing with working with different people, more knowledge and experience, and just practice becoming a better coach. Uh, I mean, you have to, uh, we have to start somewhere. So like, I, I did see that thing on Instagram that Dave Tate posted. And I was like, wow, I got like a seventeen. I'm like, wow, but I'm not. I don't think I'm that bad of a coach. Um, but yeah, I think is there for the, the I think the. Thing. The metrics he used were were kind of off, you know. I think unless – I think those metrics can only be applied to, you know, a coach that you're paying a crazy amount of money for. Yeah. Someone like, like Joey Flex, um, Joe Stanek, who's, uh, who's coaching Angelo Fortino, you know, pe- people like that. But for, for all intents and purposes, if someone has more experience and knowledge than you, you know, I don't see a problem with them coaching. You know, yeah. I've – I've never written a program. I've never coached somebody, so I wouldn't take on a client, you know. Yeah. But but like you said, you you're very new to it, but it doesn't make sense to wait ten years when you have more knowledge yeah. when you could could have been gaining ten years of experience working with clients. Yeah. And you know, every every client you work with, you know, every person you coach, every athlete you help. You're going to get better at that process for sure, and Absolutely. you're going to learn more things along the way. Every client you coach, you're going to get you're going to get better at it some way somehow. Um, what you got? So, like, what's 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 something that you've learned from from coaching online so far? Online, uh, learn to let go. <laughs> um, you're gonna like I'm I'm one of those people. I get really invested in the person I'm training. I, I get just invested in people. I'm someone that really does care, and sometimes I care too much, and then they don't care enough. So I have to kind of back off and learn to say, okay, if you're not coming this way, I, I, I'm only going to go to your level. Um, I've told you what I need. I've told you what I uh, what I want, and uh, I'm not going to keep on push. I'm not going to keep on giving, giving, giving if you're not coming and meet, meeting me. So that's the main thing, and don't uh, keep my uh, if someone like if someone doesn't do well on something, I don't hold it against me. I do, I do hold it against me, but I don't let it just ruin my day. Yeah. Before you I, don't, I, you don't, you don't feel like you're completely responsible yeah, for I, their performance. Yeah, I, I don't dwell on it. Like, okay, what happened? How can we fix it? Um, let me. What what happened that day, or what happened the week before? What was going on? Maybe their a family member died, or something. Something else happened that they were really stressed. Um, but if it, if it happens continuously, then I know. Okay, there's something. I'm there's something I'm doing wrong, and let me see what we can do to fix that. But usually. The people that communicate with me and uh, just are up there with me that want to get better and really strive to get better and all this, we're on the same page, usually end up getting pretty dang good. Um, most most of my guys gain 10 plus pounds when they work, work with me. Um, not bragging, but I'm pretty proud of that. And naturally, <laughs> like, and these guys are usually b- beginners because I'm not at that, I'm at that kind of intermediate. I'm at that kind of intermediate stage, so I'm coaching more beginners and um, just getting getting them in there. And like about six months, they put on ten pounds, and I'm like, okay, good, we're getting somewhere. So, what have you learned from programming for the team? Because you've been doing that for what two years now? Yes. Um, keep it simple. <laughs> um, before I wanted to do all kind of West Side conjugate things because that was the first programming I got introduced to. Uh, strength conditioning for football, they were really into conjugate training style. And I was like, ooh, this is like the secret, which I think it's a great training style. I really do, especially for athletes. I think it's great. It's phenomenal. It's what you should do as an athlete because as an athlete, you have to be good at, at many different um, uh, many different positions. So you're training just as many positions as you can just to get good at all. You won't be you won't be great at the, like the, a power lift, like the, at the squat bench deadlift, but you'll be good at many things instead of only good at one. Um, so yeah, keep it simple. Um, if you look on the program, yeah, I keep it really simple now, like squat, bench, deadlift. All right. 
Um, I'm not going to put any speed work in there or anything like that. I just find that the guys are getting better results from it. Uh, like they're Yeah, and up. it's the like the the guys that we have joined the team. You know, most of the time they may have a few years of lifting experience. Some of them have it from football. Some of them don't have a whole lot. You know, they've been just kind of working out on their own for a little while. And, you know, they're making progress from the program. Um, yeah. It's simple. It's hard as a beginner to not make progress on anything. Um, most of the time, you know, like they call it the beginner gains. Um, that, that's going to be the biggest margin of improvement in your lifting career is in the beginning. Yeah. Because, um, you know, there's – you're just – you're exposed to to a solid program. Um, you know, you you got people there helping you, and you're really you're really focusing on strength for mm-hmm. once, doing it the right way. You know, so whether you're doing RPE training, linear periodization, um, just you know, like you do with the the linear periodization, you know, it works. It's simple. You yeah. know, people are making improvements on it. Yeah, it's. I think simple is better, is great. I don't like to make things super complex. Mainly because, and it's, as I get as we as we get older, we probably, probably eh, we probably will have to make it more complex for ourselves, just because so we can get a different kind of training stimulus. But when you're young, you keep it basic. In order for them to build up a great base that they need, they have to do the compound movements. Ever since I started powerlifting, I have seen the best results I ever have. I stopped putting in all those curls and everything, and my biceps have grown. I've been doing chin ups, pull ups, rows deadlifts and i am this is the best progress i've ever had in my entire life just getting bigger faster stronger with the basics there you go and so so one more thing that uh that i think um you should look for in a coach is for them to be open-minded and you kind of mentioned this at the beginning of the episode them being able to to learn from you as well Um, because as an athlete, you're always improving, getting stronger, but as a coach, you're also always improving, working with athletes. And that's, that's kind of the, um, you know, every, every athlete is going to be different that you work with. So you're going to be able to learn things, you know, um, what, what doesn't work for taller lifters, what does work for shorter lifters, you know, if there are differences in training that work for males versus females. And you're going to learn those things as time goes. Mm-hmm. And you know, I, I don't want a coach that every time I try to tell them something or, you know, ask them a question on why are we doing this, um, they, they just get an attitude and think they know everything, yeah. you know. Uh, I want a coach that's going to be able to listen to the things I have to say and then, you know, answer my questions in an informational manner instead of just acting like I should know everything. Yeah. Uh, we, we don't know what we don't know. Um, exactly right. Uh, I've had strength coaches tell me that you don't know what you don't know, and I'm like, wow, I don't know what I don't know. That's crazy. <laughs> Never thought of that. Um, but yeah, keep an open mind. All my clients teach me something, and I tell them that. Like when they teach me something, I'm like, oh, you just taught me something, dude. That is awesome information. Thank you for teaching me that. Um, or every every time I get done with a client and we're about to part ways, I'm like, thank you for teaching me all the things that you taught me. I've you've helped me a lot more than you think. And it's because of you that I can keep on, continue to do this. Um, it's it's that they help you more than you think. And as a coach, like you said, we just need to continue learning, read books, look at other coaches, learn from clients. Uh, one of the the guy I'm training, the D1 guy, he's a lineman. He taught me some lineman like skill work, and I was like, this is cool. This I can use this. This is awesome. Um, like, and I I let him kind of decide what we're gonna do on the program a little bit. Like, we have different training days where we train skill work and i'm like okay we're going to do these two drills but then you have one drill that you can do whatever you want like whatever you want whatever you need to work on whatever you're weak at but it has to be whatever you're weak at whatever you're not good at Mm -hmm. so and he again he usually always teaches me something i'm like okay that works let's try it like that i'm i'm open to that so yeah just be open like you said that's a great great idea yeah so kind of jumping into the second part what what should someone look for and what should they see as a red flag when they're looking for an online coach? Um, one thing I like is how much better do they get their clients? How much, like, how much time and effort do they put in and do, does it show with their clients? Like the first year with Morgan and Zach, 
Morgan got stronger than I got. <laughs> I was like, wow, awesome. Um, he came in. Uh, we worked with him. Uh, he got stronger than me. I was like, well, I guess I did a good job then. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, yeah, looking to see if they get stronger than you um, or if they don't, if they have clients that none of them have ever gotten really that strong before, that's probably a red flag for me too. Um, talk with other clients that they've had. That's one thing I, I did with one of the coaches I was with, and majority of them said the same thing: not lack of communication. Um, he didn't really, uh, he didn't really give them the plan. He just got really defensive. He didn't really talk to him much. And I was like, okay, that's not really someone you want to be with. So look for that. Talk to other clients. Ask the coach specifically. Hey, can you send me to some other clients that you have so I can ask them about you? And sure, send them, send them that. Send them the results of other clients. Um, if they don't do that and they're re- really defensive, that's probably not the person you want to be with. Yeah, I think I think that's a big thing is talking to people that they have uh, previously or are currently coaching mm-hmm. um, to see what they think about that coach. And, you know, like um, personality is a big thing. Like um, listening to uh, Jesus talk about when, when he was looking into hiring Joey, um, he said he researched this man up and down looked all over his Instagram, Googled him, talked to other athletes that he had, um, you know, Russ, Amanda, um, and asked them, you know, what he was like because they're, you can have a great coach and a great athlete and them not be a good fit together. You know, just personality, attitude-wise, whatever it may be, they just might not be a good fit. Um, and then, you know, the the only thing that an online coach really brings if they're not going to be in person is a personalized program that should be programmed to your needs mm-hmm. and and what you want to get better at. And then as well as if it doesn't include form and technique feedback, like when you send them videos, if that's not part of what you pay for, that's not a good online coach. Yeah. You know, they're... They're honestly probably just pulling some BS program off the internet. Um, and there's a lot of good ones out there, but they're probably just pulling one off the internet, copy and pasting it, maybe changing a few accessories and sending it your way. Yeah. Um, there's, there's so many programs out there that you can search up and, you know, do on your own for free yeah. instead of paying, you know, a hundred, 200, 250 bucks a month for a coach that's just going to copy and paste something for you. Yeah. You know what really gets me though, um, like these YouTube guys, like they're, they're in great shape. I'll give them that and everything, but they say, "Hey, buy my program, and you'll get just as good as me." I'm like, "Dude, you, I, I could run all over you with all the information." Like that, what that's what really ticks me off sometimes. No hate to those guys. I mean, they're trying to make a buck. I understand that, but learn some things. Actually, sit down and read something. Don't just use your body as a way to sell things. Learn how to actually program for somebody and actually program for something because i guarantee you some of those some of those programs are just hey i might i'll do this yeah let's do that let's do that they're just putting stuff on paper not really with a rhyme or reason so um <laughs> that's all i'm gonna say on that one that's my little rant on that one yeah and like you can have um a coach that is a phenomenal power lifter or yeah. you know has one ifbb shows whatever it may be um and they're just a bad coach um, yep. for, for reasons that, you know, we previously listed that they don't have. Um, so, you know, just, just looking at them and saying, uh, they're jacked, they can get me jacked. That's not always the case. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, do a little bit of research, make sure that they're a right fit for you. And if you're, if you're power lifting, um, the, it shouldn't be an extra fee to have them, um, critique your. included in the price yeah they definitely it definitely does it definitely has to be included if you're not if they're not including that say oh that's extra be like all right well i'm gone bye um yeah but i think what one of the things that i've heard people talk about what makes a great a good coach is of and i kind of agree with this too usually the people that are coaches have done everything they possibly can to get where they are and they're they're not the most genetically gifted people in the world sometimes. They're just not. But they do everything they possibly can to get to where they are, and they're trying to get to that up elite level 
by just trying different things, learning, reading about everything, trying to figure out, okay, what's the best methods? What are the best ways for me? How And just they have to sift through all this knowledge to try to figure out, okay, what are the things that I can use to help me on this uh, – across this uh, uh, plan, not a plan, uh, this journey. And then you have to just genetically get to people that all they have to do is pick up a barbell once and like, oh, I just picked up 600 pounds. Cool. <laughs> and I'll come back and maybe do 620 the next time. But they just, there's a difference between just being good at something and then working your ass off and learning everything you possibly can to be good at it. And that's usually yeah, that's... how coaches learn. Yeah, and that's for the for the most part. The longer someone has been in the sport, the better they'll be at coaching. But that's not always a given. I mean, you can look at some NFL players. I guarantee you, they don't know how to coach. <laughs> I mean, they're great yeah, athletes yeah, for it's... sure. But you tell them to coach somebody, they'll be like, "Uh, you do this with this foot." They don't even know why they're good. They just know that they're good. Yeah. And so it's a coach that's, to know that's why a lot of... you're good. It's, it's a genetic thing. They've just always been good. They don't know how to make yeah. other people good. Yeah. It's kind of hard to take somebody from 0 to 100 if you've always been, just been at 100 and you've never been at 0. Yeah. So if someone if someone wants to get into coaching, what would you recommend for them? Uh, read. <laughs> look at other coaches. Uh, I'm going to recommend some coaches to look at. Charles Poliquin, uh, he's, he's passed away, but he... He passed away recently, not just a couple years ago, but he's got a lot of great information. Read plenty of books. Read Start With Starting Strength, 3 by 5 as simple as you can get it. 531, Jim Wendler. Um, and talk to other people about what they've read, or talk to, like, I like to talk to Caleb about his stuff. I think it's really interesting to talk about to Caleb. I like to talk to Dylan. Find people you can talk to that are better than you at it, and then use some of the things that they say, use what works for you, and then if it doesn't work, keep it in keep it in your head, but then toss it aside because it doesn't work for you. I like that. Sounds good. Always keep learning. Yeah. That's you it. Know, it has to be it. There's so much information out there. You're never going to know everything. Yeah. So, like, Seth, you want to be the greatest, the best powerlifter in, the, in what weight class? Whatever weight class I'm in at the time. There you go. You so say you want to be the best of the best. My goal is to just be the best coach to ever live. <laughs> <laughs> That's a big goal. I like yeah. it. So you got yours. I've got mine. So, in, it, but in order for, for us for to get there, we have to continue to learn. We have to continue to grow. We have to stay open minded. We have to con continue to adapt. And just everything that we mentioned, you have to con keep doing that for the rest of your life, basically. Yeah, and I've. Uh... I don't know if you've, if you've thought about it for yourself, but, like, I've realized that being the best power lifter in the world, it may take 15, 20 years. Yeah. You know? It's going to take time. But imagine how much knowledge you're going to acquire and how much experience you're going to get in that 10 to 20-year time. Yeah. it's. I've already gained so much knowledge in just the year and a half I've been in college. Yeah, it's, you know? it's crazy and to think about it. Like, I love to see some of Jesus' stories. He's like, uh, when are you going to squat um, – like a thousand pounds he's like probably in the next year or two he he thinks long term instead of thinking i'm gonna squat it in the next couple of months he's like no i might might be two years down the road i, I like that i like yeah. that approach to just look at the long like okay i'm doing this now but what can i do 10 years down the road if i keep doing this it's yeah. just crazy um we've said it on here before and i'll say it again power lifting especially is about doing the little things right all the time for a long time Yes. And same thing with coaching. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, just learning, doing the little things for coaching, and just doing them for a long time. Exactly. Couldn't say it any better. <laughs> yeah, man. It's it's crazy to, uh, like, listen to Jesus on podcasts. And don't forget who whose podcast he came on first before he had that stellar performance. <laughs> After that, dude, he just blew up. <laughs> He did. He he's been on like three or four other ones now. After that last meet, he did. Yeah. But uh, I, I'm gonna say it right now. I've said it before. Jesus Oliveras will go down as one of the greatest powerlifters to ever live. Oh, for sure, dude. He's, he, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's all there is to That's say. That's all there is to say. 
He's just going to be one of the best. And it's I mean, he already is. He already is the best. Yeah. Well, he, in in certain be categories. Ray. He's got to be Ray. Oh, he, he will be Ray. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can guarantee that. I wonder what, I'd love to, see, to hear what Ray and uh, Dan Bell think. Ooh, that, oh. that'd be interesting to get all three of them in a podcast. Oh, dude. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> dude, that, that would be good. That, that'd be intense. I, I, I don't know about you, dude, but we just have to sit back and just listen to that one. And all, you, know, <laughs> you, know, you know all the knowledge that could come out of that, out of all the experience? I, I don't think they would really have any beef. I think they all respect each other. You oh, know? I'm sure they, they're all you they're all super anything. big, strong. Yeah, you just you just let them talk. Yeah. Oh golly, dude, that'd be awesome. Shoot. Maybe we need to get messages yeah. to some people. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we'll we'll for sure have uh, Jesus back on at some point. Yep. But uh, we yeah, it's been uh, it's been a great first. Uh, what has it been? Four months. Yeah, um, five months. Yes, we started in the beginning of school, right? Yeah, August. So, and again, thank you to everybody that's listening. We really appreciate the support. And wherever and, uh, you are in the world, thank you. Ups and downs. Yeah, yeah. Wherever you're listening from, um, if you you know if you've been listening since day one or this is your first podcast, listen. Thank you for the support. Uh, don't forget to check out. We're doing a giveaway right now. Um, depending on when you listen to this, it is going to run until January 4th at 11.59 p.m. Central Time. Um, giveaway, it's, um, uh, we've teamed up with A7 Co. Um, they're a gear company that makes some really solid gear. We're not sponsored, uh, but they have uh, supported us in this giveaway. And we'll be selecting two winners from our Instagram um each winner will get to pick out their choice of a pair of wrist straps we have um we have medium stiff and flex um in 55 77 and 99 centimeters so you get to pick out a pair of wrist straps a a pair of knee sleeves um uh an a7 bar grip hoodie and a shaker cup um and all you do is pay shipping everything else is free check out our instagram for that um we'll be doing the drawing on january 5th so uh, go ahead and enter in that and read the rules on our Instagram post. Yep, and this will be the last podcast before the new year. So, Seth, what is your New Year's resolution? <laughs> ah, I don't make those. I don't. I don't do that junk. What? But New Year's resolutions are dumb. Why? Why? Why should you wait till the the start of a new year to make a goal? Well, dude, some people like that motivation. I think it. I, some people, it's it's great. It helps them out. They're like, okay, I'm doing this. I'm gonna do it. And some people do it. But the people that don't, that's the people that usually, yeah, they, they're not gonna win in life. Sometimes. <laughs> Always have a goal in mind. Always. For sure. But what's but what's you gonna, what's you like? Okay, what are your 2021 lifting goals? What do you want to hit in 2021? Uh, so. I mean, I've really only thought as far as nationals. Um, uh, I'd really like to hit a 275 kilo deadlift, which is 606. Um, hit at some point in 2020 or 2021. Um, I'd really like to hit at least 600 squat and 400 bench. That would take me to a 1600 total, which is 727. So I think if I could go from like 646 now to 750 by the end of next year. And that's completely reasonable. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, maybe if I end up getting a velocity deadlift suit, that'll be the final secret. <laughs> but um, yeah, 600 squat and deadlift and 400 bench and then uh, a or 750 total. That'd be nice. What about you, Alman? Um, so for me, uh, I'd like to hit a 500 squat next year. Well, 500 squat, raw, no suit. Or I might. Put, I am. I, they did add that new raw, that new division to USAPL, and I am going to do that. <laughs> raw with wraps. Yes, raw with wraps. I'm going to do that. Um, I, I, I don't consider that cheating. <laughs> <laughs> wow, you got you got a little piece of equipment. But not all the equipment, and it's not cheating yet. <laughs> nope, not yet, not yet. Uh, I'm not a cheater yet. Maybe I will be one of these days. Um, but then, for bench, I'd probably, I like I'd like 350 somewhere around there. Um, deadlift, 
uh, probably 550, something like that, maybe 600. We'll see what happens. I'm not going to put any def- so do you, definites. Do you have any plans on uh, doing Strongman after your competition in February? Yes, definitely, for sure. Uh, for that one, I just want to uh, win my first, like, I'll win, the, I'll win a first novice show and then win an, uh, an open in the in the below 231 weight class. You got a lot of weight to put on before you get 231. Yeah, so I got a lot of time to grow, like, got a lot of time to learn. Got a lot of time to get in some experience. So, yeah. But as a strong man now, dude, it's like, who's the fastest strong guy? Yeah, you got to be fast. I, um, I watched half of the uh, the World's Strongest Man um, on TV yesterday. And Brian Shaw, he's getting kind of old. Yeah. He, uh, he didn't do so hot. It's a lot he was of actually events. young. Yeah, like the first one, they had to carry a 275-pound anvil. Um, however far, and then hop under a, uh, a yoke with three dirt bikes on it <laughs> and run with that. Yeah. And, you know, um, Dude, there's we- that. They did They did a log medley yeah. um, with, like, five different logs. They did a stone medley, loading five stones in a row. Um, you just – you got you to gotta have a certain amount of stamina to you to be a strong man, for sure. For sure. But he did win his own show at his, at his own home territory. He had he had a, a, oh, yeah, a competition yeah, yeah. at his house. The, he did win that. Yeah, was it the Shaw, Shaw Open, the Shaw Classic. Paul, there it is. But it was just all a bunch of static events, like a powerlifting meet, basically. Yeah, Brian, he 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 will for sure go down as a legend. He still got the most wins. Yep, and he's fifth place in the world. I mean, at forty years old, it's pretty good. Yeah, he's uh, but uh. About time to wrap this episode up, Altman. I think it was a pretty good one. I hope uh, I hope people got something from this episode that they can, when they're choosing a coach or if they're looking to become a coach, they learn something and they can um, use information from this episode to better their career as an athlete or coach. Yep. So, everyone yep. have a good time and happy new year. Happy new year. We'll see you guys next year. We've uh, looking at some. Pretty great guests lined up. We um, we're excited for next year. We're gonna we're gonna keep pumping out content, good content for you guys. Something you can learn from. Yep, it's gonna be a big year. Next year is the growing year. There it is. But um, thank you guys for your support. Thank you for listening. We'll catch you guys next week. Um, don't forget to check us out on Instagram at triple dot b dot podcast. Um, as well as our giveaway on there up until January 4th at 1159. Altman, where can people check you out? At Big Strength. There it is. Check me out if you want to at Seth.Todd76. Um, I don't post a whole lot of lifting, basically just meat recaps. But um, follow me if you want. You know, it is what it is. It's okay. Um, I, I, I do I, post stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Altman does post <laughs> motivational and informational content. So give uh, Big Strength a follow. But uh, we'll see you guys next week. All right, guys.